historical wisdom in the conflict of faith and science, enabling both of them to fulfill their humanistic mission. Both of the ideas for the lecture were written down 30 years ago. This is the paper which you have um, 30 years ago and presented in Taiwan at East-West Conference. Before, about 10 years ago, I was fortunate to be selected among 200 applicants into a course offered at the University of California in Los Angeles on African humanities. So 20 were selected. I was lucky to be one of them. So I went to Los Angeles and it opened my eyes. You know. It was a course about Ghana culture, Ghana, Ghana humanities. And requirement in the course was to learn one of the 50 languages. So it was Akan, A-K-A-N language, which I had to learn very fast. And kind of pigeon, pigeon knowledge of Akan with dictionary. And I was able to translate from Akan. And I found out that all translations were via Proverbs. <coughs> and as soon as I was able to decipher some of these Proverbs, I was excited about finding out, and it was the one I told you, rolling rock from the mountain does not collect moss. It dawned on me. I heard it in my Czech language, in Russian, in German, in English. And where does it come from? Do all of these nations borrow from one another? So it became a great puzzle for me. Where does it come from? And why this aspect of Proverbs was never properly studied. They were collected by all nations, uh, but set aside without deeper explanation. So this is how I came to study Proverbs, and 10 years later, after the course in, at the University of California, I was invited to attend the uh, East-West Conference on Humanities. I was always interested in Eastern way of thinking. So I was invited to present a paper. So this is the paper I presented. 30 years later, I find the paper which fits into this class. So I hope you were able to glance through it. And this paper, which appreciates the third dimension of our Western culture and civilization next to face science, there has always been wisdom without deeper defining, just being expressed, and the common denominator were proverbs. The proverbs were formulated always in a highly economical way, poetic way, short as the, the best, or comes razor. And in all cultures, they knew about this Occam's razor without knowing who Occam ever was. So proverbs were expressed in this most economical way. 
so so far for the introduction. There seems to me basically just two powerful forces being constantly in a mutual interplay that we call human nature and the world we live in. The long history of this interplay gave us millennia long religious tradition as we have discussed it in form of animism, uh, fetishism, polytheism, and monotheism. A relatively short emergence of scientific enterprise of the pre-Socratics followed by Plato and Aristotle and ending in famous Alexandrian school was replaced by triumphant Christianity and Muslim movement with Hinduism and Buddhism in the East. So this is kind of overview of uh, human development. The Western monotheism survived for a millennium when in the 15th century acquired a new form of that of Protestantism due to political, social, and religious upheavals, many new movements emerged on the scene in the form of new emphasis on man, in form of humanism and renaissance. So at the end of this millennium of Christianity, we have at first a religious split into Protestantism, hand in hand followed by the emergence of humanism and Renaissance. Rebirth of what? Rebirth of the world of antiquity, especially of Greece of Greek culture, civilization, literature, philosophy, science. It coincided with collapse of Eastern Christianity, with collapse of Constantinople. 1453, Constantinople was occupied by Turks. This was the end of Eastern Christianity. There were two streams which followed from Constantinople. One of them went to the north, to Russia, and settled down in Moscow. Thus, Moscow became the third Rome. <coughs> the western route went to Venice, and cities in Italy, like Florence, when it established very powerful Renaissance centers, which influenced the whole aspect of Italian culture. These are 13th, 14th century. Christianity in its core, Western Christianity uh, ruled from Rome, had a new enemy in form of Mohammedan movement, which in the meantime occupied the whole North Africa, moved into Spain. And it looked like nobody can stop it. France was invaded. Luckily enough, Western Christianity, Roman Catholic Church, produced a great man among themselves, Thomas Aquinas. It was Thomas Aquinas who replaced 
the Platonic, and Plato became the philosopher of Western Christianity, introduced by St. Augustine. So this is the Platonic form of Christianity, philosophically form. It was Thomas Aquinas who replaced Plato by Plato's pupil, Aristotle. So the look from uh, to ideas goes down to realistic look into the nature in front of you. It is remarkable that it was Aristotle who was, by that time, the spiritual, philosophical leader of Mohammedan movement. Muslims borrowed Aristotle. It was Aristotle who put stiffness into their back, philosophic, also artistic. So it was Thomas Aquinas who decided I will replace Plato by Aristotle, and now we can defend ourselves. But he did not save the church. Protestant movement starting at the end of 14th century by Jan Hus, Bohemian reformer, uh, continued by Luther, Martin Luther, and Zwingli, and other reformers. They established Protestant movement which the church could not stop. So you have humanism, renaissance, protestant movement, you know, western Christianity is falling apart. In, during the 15th and 16th century, there is a tremendous growth of renaissance ideas, which are announced mostly scientifically the most dangerous teaching ever announced for the church was Copernican sun-centered system of our solar system. This very teaching announced by a high-ranking official of Roman Catholic Church, Copernicus, Stated, you are wrong. We turn around the sun, not sun around us. But what about the Bible? He says, I'm, I won't publish it until I am on deathbed. He did not dare to publish. Until he was died. Then others, in the meantime, took the teaching and started distributing it. It had many followers, outstanding scientific followers, like uh, uh, Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno, for his defending of Copernicus died at a stake by burning. But there were others who were coming after him. It was Kepler, Tycho de Brecht, and Galileo. The movement could not be stopped. What follows is era of science. Out of post-Renaissance movement came scientific age, which culminated in the teaching of Isaac Newton. We have a new physics, we have a new astronomy. The church still did not accept Copernican teaching. 
not until 1829, pretty late, 300 years late, the church official let the sun stand still by papal decree. And the sun and the air started dancing around the sun. <laughs> It was late, but we have to be glad that it ever happened. But it was getting too late. So I have mentioned that there are two forces, human nature and the war. The man was not so far to start asking <coughs> questions. What is human nature? What is the world? This was the question of this organization. They answered what the world was, disagreed, and gave us various teachings about the nature of the world. What was human nature? and the scientific influence. This was in post-Renaissance period regarded as being subjective. And by being subjective, being weak, not scientific. So, this victorious post-Renaissance science did not permit to look into us. It was not objective. They looked into objective world, which was out there, not into subjective world. The world of feelings, of will, subjective. We have to wait until 20th century before we will dare to start asking questions. What is this inner world? <coughs> this subjective world. And there are various approaches to it. At the end it came in the field of science itself. <coughs> it was in quantum physics with discovery of consciousness. I was fortunate to have a, a seminar at the University of Alaska with one of the physical rebels. What was his name? Hello. And the Hungarian scientist. Wigner? Wigner. Eugene Wigner. Nobel Prize winner in physics, who introduced into quantum physics concept of consciousness. There was observer already in Niels Bohr, but who is observer? Introduced conscious observer, and conscious observer has consciousness. It was a turning point in quantum mechanics. It was rather difficult for many of my colleagues here at the University of Alaska you know, to embrace Eugene Wigner. So Eugene Wigner asked somebody if they had philosophy and somebody said, oh, we have a depression. May I have seen him? So we met and we became friends immediately. I had a seminar with him, attended by many professors. But it was difficult, rather difficult, for professors to come into the seminar. 
our scientific establishment did not know what to do with Professor Wigner. Professor who? Even he was tri Nobel Prize winner. So this tells you about state of art thinking in advanced sciences. This was about 30, 40 years ago. <coughs> I have met uh, Eugene Wigner on few occasions, among others. I organized for him a seminar in Wittgenstein's conference in Austria, in Vienna, which he had to cancel because of ill health in the last moment. Shortly after that he died. And all his life he was walking among colleagues who did not understand. They did not want to understand. This was the way of into consciousness. Conscious physicist. Conscious psychologist. And here we are you know, at a breakthrough into human nature in form of penetration into consciousness. We still have difficulty to get into it. We cannot get collectively holding hand, let's go on a trip into consciousness. We can do it only individually. And that's subjective. Oh no, I beg you, no more. No more subjective. But this is the only way. So we have breakthroughs here. And one of the great breakthroughs was discovery of language. At the beginning of 20th century, hand in hand with formulation of quantum mechanics, there was a movement called semiotics study of language, semiotics, study of signs. Now, we reduce languages into signs. We operate, a communicate with signs. The signs are translatable in various languages. All of these are signs. How is it possible to throw a sign on somebody and so that the other person understands what I mean by that sign? What does it mean to go from language to another language, to turn language? You carry with your signs. Sign next to signs, meaning. And the meaning is primary. This was my point when I was St. John. When I said St. John was not right. At the beginning was not the word. At the beginning was the meaning. The meaning acquired a sign in St. John's language, signs. But before he had a meaning, he tried to communicate. So when, whenever we communicate, we communicate meanings. So this is a beginning of 20th century when we have discovered the world of meaning. How to get to this world of meaning? We know when you learn and speak two languages that there is a meaning which binds these two languages. There are two, not two meanings, German meaning you know, and Russian meaning, Chinese meaning. There is a meaning as such which is being communicated in various systems of science. 
going to, this is a deep penetration into the world of consciousness. We have also quite a few philosophers who succeeded here, succeeded in various ways. One of the great 20th century philosophers was Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, Viennese, Viennese philosopher, engineer, who became a full-fledged philosopher, studying under under Bertrand Russell. He produced uh, his first little booklet called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, in which he simply explained the mystery of language, that language reads in the world, so the world determines what the language is. He started a scientific movement, which was called Vienna Circle, which liked this way. The world is producing the language. Now we can select which language is correct, scientific. So it became foundation for a very powerful positivistic school in Vienna during the 20s and was closed practically by Hitler when all followers of Vienna Circle escaped to the West, to England and British colonies, Canada and United States. This is how the United States acquired a core of these linguistic philosophers, positivistic philosophers. But Wittgenstein was a very strange person. After he published the book with the help of Bertrand Russell, Tractatus, he gave up philosophy, disappeared from the world. Nobody knew where he was. He reappeared in Vienna and people found out that he became an elementary school teacher in southern Austria. He was very well known, mostly due to his strictness. He never had a book which was suspicious for the villagers, teacher who doesn't have a book. And he was very strict with students. He introduced them in elementary school into foundation of mathematics. And the students were so advanced, they didn't know how come, but he was such a great teacher that he gave them the whole mathematical insights with examples. He was able to fix any problem with machinery as an engineer. But he was strict, and once he spanked Mayer's son, <laughs> who, who, who misbehaved in the class. <coughs> this was the end of Wittgenstein. He had to leave the village and return back to Vienna. And he tried to join Jesuit order. He was not successful. He went to a garden. Then he built a house for his sister, which was a, a monument of modern architecture in Vienna. And in the meantime, he was discovered by positivistic Vienna circle, which used his book Tractatus as a Bible. They invited him. He came to the circle of scientists, and one of the first questions was, I have to say, he wrote the Tractatus in form of seven propositions. Each proposition, after one, was developed into one point 
1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1.
as we know now, thanks to Dr. Siu and to study of many researchers, that it is a universal cross-cultural way of communicating some ultimate findings of human nature. During the last three, four hundred years, these folks ways started disappearing. Proverbs were not taken seriously. Some strange things were happening to human nature. We were getting into wars, nonsensical war, two world wars in 20th century. What were the foundations of human nature? One of the most well-educated nations in the world, Germany, produced a movement called Nazism. Italy, fascism, Russia, communism. What happens with the wisdom? What happened in these nations with the notion of wisdom? And it goes on and on. After First World War, it was officially stated this was the last war. There will never be another one before we realized there was a second world war. Followed by wars, we have not stopped. We got ourselves into Middle East in a very foolish way. We don't know how to get out of it. We are getting sinking deeper and deeper. What happened? with wisdom. What happened with our leaders? But an average citizen looks down at this folk's knowledge. So in, in my findings, I have discovered that it is exactly the field where the human race has to return to this cross-cultural findings, universal findings of wisdom expressed through proverbs. In ancient Greece, you probably know that the the seer in Delphi declared Socrates as the wisest of all men. When it was brought to Socrates' attention, he says, my God, you know, how could I be the wisest when I know only one thing that I don't know? I know that I don't know. Socrates knew that he didn't know what holds the world together, natural world and human world. He didn't know what really is the greatest mystery. And he said, I know that I know. Chinese great philosopher used proverbs himself. Those who know, don't talk. Those who talk, don't know. So, you, you discover in Proverbs something deep, something what you are amazed to hear that you have to accept it but how to act accordingly with what is being said. Our past generation knew much better, I think before the advent of science and scientific way of thinking. There was the dimension of 
with a partially decided lumen relation. But it was becoming less and less important until nowadays. It practically disappeared. I'm looking. Can I ask something? Because uh, those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. Is that actually a quotation of a man who wrote it? Uh, when does that become a proverb? Because it is Chinese proverb, you know, I think at that time. Oh, it's, it's from that time. So from that time. So he coined it himself. Six century BC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he didn't actually say it, Panche, just... Yeah, he said it. He said it, but he's quoted, you know, and it was taken over and collected. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Siu collected all proverbs. Mm -hmm. So in 6th century, 5th century BC, it was collected and given to next generation. And Chinese are great in collection of proverbs. I think there might be able to make a connection between that and Wittgenstein's uh, suspicion of teachers with books. Yeah. Because that phrase, those that know, uh, don't, don't, don't speak, speak because they're afraid that while their wisdom is appropriate for that time, if it becomes uh, enshrined as, uh, permanently, it can be a disaster later. So they recognize the temporariness of this wisdom. <coughs> and temporary of us is very cool. It could be temporary for a few years, a few centuries, maybe thousands, or just 20 years, whatever. But so much harm, harm is caused by enshrining certain truths that have outlived its usefulness. Yeah. There is a certitude in it, in, in Proverbs. Yeah. And there is a weak part of it that it is being repeated very often without full understanding. And you repeat it because you heard it. That is, those who know don't talk. Yeah. Those who talk don't know. I drive many people crazy. They ask me, is this your last word? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you keep your mouth shut? <laughs> From now on, I agree. Uh, Wittgenstein said, you know, that it's best not to write anything more. Uh, <coughs> yes, yeah. Wittgenstein, whereof uh, one cannot speak, thereof one should be silent. This became a modern philosophical problem, you know. And then People are repeating, about, yeah. repeating Wittgenstein, you know, without fully comprehending that at the end of his thinking processes, he said, where one cannot speak, there one should be silent. And I have been studying accounts in English. I have discovered some, some amazing statements. Translated from Akar, wisdom outweighs strength. Whereas a liar takes a thousand years to go on a journey, the one who speaks the truth follows and overtakes the liar in a day. When deeds speak, Words are nothing. Power must be handled in the manner of holding an egg in the hand. If you hold too firmly, it breaks. If you hold too loosely, it drops.
when virtue found a town, town grows and lasts long. And here is the one. A moving rock will never grow moss. Or the last one. There are no gods to support a lazy person. One's greatest support is one's own art. So these are translations from Akan language. And I think you hear echoes from English, from German, from Russian. They are very similar. So this Ghanaian proverbs uh, opened my eyes and also opened the establishment of the United Nations, which used one of the Ghanaian proverbs, which says that one head doesn't go into the meeting which is used by United Nations. There are many heads with many views, but you have to listen to many views, not one head only. So is there a possibility we can return into emphasis of wisdom? I think we have to change our educational system. To change is entirely um, emphasize the nature of proverbs. The question is where do proverbs come from? It is my conjecture, and I, I gave this conjecture to Dr. Sium, that in modern philosophy, there was one great, real great man, Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant is German philosopher, born 1724, died beginning of the 19th century. Immanuel Kant. During the modern philosophical explanation of how we learn about the world and about ourselves. There are two distinct approaches. One of them is continental, based on belief in reason, which they took over from Greeks, mostly from Greeks. The other one is what later Greeks introduced, Epicureans. This is belief in senses. So modern philosophy is a conflict between continental belief in reason on one hand and in Anglo-Saxon belief in senses. The entire British culture has been traditionally empirical, belief in senses. This goes back into 13th century, 14th century, into Ockham, into all great British thinkers, Francis Bacon, a scientist. There is strong inclination in trust in five senses. In 17th century, the end of 17th and 18th century, there was a man who is called Pope of Empiricism, John Locke.
Shama. He expressed it in a very short way. There is nothing in human intellect what has not been delivered into it by the way of senses. We do not have anything in our intellect what was not collected by five senses. This is a statement of empirical Pope for British tradition. This is how most of the British scientists believed until the time of beginning of 18th century, which produced one of the greatest British thinker, David Hume. David Hume. He became the critic of empiricism, working empirically but he looked at empiricism and the most powerful weapon of empiricism, inductive logic. In logic of induction, you connect phenomena together and see how they are connected. And you believe that they are universally connected and tomorrow seeing all these phenomena will be exactly the same. So the future has to resemble the past. David Hume became a rebel of British tradition in saying that the sun does not have to rise tomorrow. On British Berlin, it, it had risen, went down, risen down, risen down. This is the rhythm, this is the nature. And he dared to say, sun does not have to rise tomorrow. What a shock. They paid him well. They did not let him teach at the university. He could not get any job. You know, he was well paid by the society. But what he said here disturbed this German philosopher Immanuel Kant. And he is the first one who tried to overbridge these two traditions, continental and British senses and reason and give us a teaching how our reason connects with senses and how it produces knowledge. <coughs> so there are sentences we make which are empirical sentences. When it rains I take an umbrella. And there are most of the sentences we are using are taken from our empirical experience. There is a statement when when you have a square and when you have the square you have two triangles. A triangle we know has 180 degrees of inside angles. So two triangles have exactly 182. We can take only one, 
and we have Pythagorean triangle. You can figure out inside angles 180 degrees and outside angle, complementary angle. Derivation here, the processes have nothing to do with senses. It is operation of reason. These are mathematical statements. Continent was always strong in belief in operation of reason. So Kant brought these two together, empirical and rational state and explain how knowledge works. He gave us a teaching that human mind is like a huge mill. At the beginning you pour grain into it and it starts walking and produce flour and then it makes bread and at the end loaves of bread fell, fall out of the oven. So this is human mind which works with the basics and produces complex products. Kant being a German, he loved to give fancy names to these propositions. Empirical propositions he called synthetic. Synthetic. This second rational type of proposition he called a priori. These were two worlds which divided continent and Britain. Kant brought them together. The question was. Could there be the case that there are synthetic a priori, synthetic which are inductive, and a priori which are necessary? Could there be a necessary empirical statement? And here is the point. Kant a great thinker. He was limited by the age in which he lived. He declared that there are synthetic a priori, and the synthetic a priori exist in Euclidean geometry, Aristotelian logic, Newtonian physics. This was belief of his age. Every educated man in Kant's age believed that. So he used it. This is something that will always remain with human race. This is the synthetic a priori. We will always have Euclidean geometry, Aristotelian logic, Newtonian physics. What he declared as once forever is similar to Newton, who also declared a great historical mistake in his famous I do not pretend to give you a hypothesis. <laughs> Hypothesis non fingo, to make it more elegant, you know, it was expressed in Latin. Hypothesis non fingo, I don't pretend to give you a hypothesis. It is a hard stuff of this universe, it will never change. Kant did the same 
more than 200 years later. It gives us a lesson. Don't generalize temporary findings. You can pay a dear price for it. Now, you know, with the teaching about synthetic a priori, I apply that there are synthetic a priori, and these are our proverbs. Our proverbs in this cross-cultural international communication express something which will always be with us. What Kant believed was Euclidean geometry, logic, and, and Newtonian physics. I dare to say we have synthetic a priori. Kant was striving for, and they are in our international program. The finding expressed in Proverbs express some deep voice of human nature, the deepest one, which does not change. The statement from all Chinese, some Japanese, German, Russian, they are still valid today as they were thousand years ago. When I mentioned this to Dr. Siu, he brought a bottle of wine and we have finished it and very fast. He was so excited you know, that before he didn't know what synthetic a priori was, but he grasped it. Now, the proverbs are synthetic. If this is the case, we should draw some conclusion. We should go back and teach how to handle the synthetic a priori, which are universal truth in our cross-cultural communication, expressing findings which are universally valid across from all races, across from all times. That exactly synthetic a priori, what Kant believed, he had it. You know. We know we did not have it. I hope nobody will come and <laughs> put, put me down. You know. <laughs> this is a really gracious mystery. major preoccupation of myself 40 to 30, 40 years ago. After all this time, I was returning almost every year back to it, but I did not find audience, you know, because these were old folks' ways. <laughs> and so I am fortunate that I found enough people who are willing to listen to it. And I know I hope some of you are convinced that it might be the case. Yeah. Um, you have a question? I just, no, I, I, it just struck me that uh, in many ways folk art of every kind is a sort of a synthetic a priori in this sense. Uh, for, for a folk song, um, uh, drawing, you know, those, those flowers that are on the on the Czech pottery or the Spanish pottery. They they seem to sort of be repeating themselves very much like the proverbs. Yeah, it must, it must be the case. It must apply to other yeah, arts, in, art forms. In all artistic forms. Unity in the arts. There's a cross culture too. Yeah. But in our verbal communication, using signs with meaning, mm -hmm. in 
saying a proverb. We are announcing a meanings, meaning of science, understandable to audience which is familiar with this particular science. In, in uh, Czech, we, uh, it occurred to me, Ranim Tace Dardo Scarce, early bird makes his father than bird which awakes. <laughs> but you know, it is also Rani Ptace Dalto Scarce in Czech language. So it is poetic expression of this early bird brings it farther than somebody who does not get up so early. So there is an attempt to express it poetically. And my grandmother was a great master of it, you know. She spoke poetically about everything, you know. It drove us crazy, you know. We heard it very often, you know. And the rhythm, it was poetic rhythm. You know, where did she learn that? It was a precondition of conveying program. And she enjoyed it. She didn't learn it in school. <coughs> from whom did she learn it? From her mother, from her father. Now, we don't know the sources, you know. We don't have 101 proverbs, you know. 101 English proverbs, you know, or Irish proverbs. Irish are great in proverbs, too. Dr. Seal writes about all nations, about all proverbs he was able to con collect. Yeah, please. I, I think that's a good comment because it relates to other arts in general. I mean, the arts, uh, I mean, art, art that endures, whether it's uh, poems, proverbs, music, yeah. folk songs, they have a uh, universal appeal, even if you don't understand the immediate context, even if you don't understand the language in the piece of music or, or folk songs, you may not understand the music, but you can appreciate the musicality of the tunes and the emotions behind it. Musicality is yeah. synthetic a priori, that you can understand. Right. And some music, like Bach's music, mm -hmm. you know, overwhelmingly Bach's music, appears to nations of yeah. all over the world. And same with some African songs. Yeah. The language is totally unintelligible. Yeah. You can appreciate the musicality of yeah. the song. The you know, talking about music, when I was in Beijing, I went to a Chinese opera. I could not take it. I realize I'm coming from a different world. <laughs> there, it was not synthetic a priori. Uh -huh. I did not and I admit it to my Chinese friends. <coughs> they were amazed that I understood. But interestingly, the first few times I heard it, to me it was just noise. Yeah. But it, I learned to appreciate it. Noise I don't understand. Yeah. It is noise. Yeah. But, but once you understand it, then you can appreciate it, the, the, the emotion yeah. behind it. And even if, again, even if you don't understand the language, yeah. and, uh, and the thing about opera is you don't have to understand the text. You can just appreciate the uh, musicality, the theatrical, the drama. There's so much, so many levels. And even Western opera, I used to hate vocal music. I like only, only instrument, instrumental music. And now I love vocal. And, and again, even if it's in a foreign language, you know, I just listen for the musicality of it. And I think what transformed me was here in, uh, since I used to like only instrumentals, I loved, there was a Mantovani uh, sort of an elevator music person, but he had a version of uh, One Fine Day from the opera Modern Butterfly. And that music was so beautiful, especially the strings. I got to appreciate, once I learned to love that, I loved the, the vocal version even more. Yeah. No. You know, it gives us insight into communication.
And insight into communication should give us insight into education. When we educate our young generation, we have to know how to connect ourselves with the young people. This is especially important in teaching of this upper world. This is the great weakness of our educational system, to teach mathematics to our children. They have great difficulties to lift themselves into the new level of abstraction. It's very, very difficult to explain it. Most of our teachers don't know. They are one lesson ahead of the class. One lesson ahead in the textbook. Nobody notices. They are always well prepared. One lesson ahead. They miss entirely, you know, this mystery of communication. What proverbs can achieve and what they achieve that they are understood, how understood they are really, you know, when people understand the proverb, but how deep they are touched, we don't know. So what seems to be self-evident that Proverbs must be the means of ideal communication. Again, we don't know really what we are achieving. What, what, of them, what about the saying, those who know don't speak? Those if you don't know. speak, then you can't explain to anybody the meaning of the proverb. Yeah, it's actually I get into trouble. <laughs> and I said, no, this was my last word. From now on, I will shut up. <laughs> and amen. <laughs> so the mystery was just touched on, you know, on the surface. We did not solve anything. I can repeat, those who know, don't know. <laughs> those who talk, don't know. I try to speak in spite of that. I, I don't know how far I have succeeded. <laughs> it is up to you. I hope you will give me a good evaluation. need to earn you, friend. I depend on it. <laughs> My next contract depends on your value. <laughs> so thank you very much for your... Well, I've been told that this is really your last lecture, yes. but we never know. We're Andy. hoping it won't be. <laughs> last ball, last ball. But I want to say on behalf of Ollie, thank you so much for all of you that you have done, given us all these years. And if this really is your last lecture, we hope we'll see you sitting out here and adding to our discussions at some point. Those who know don't talk. In spite of what I tried many times, you convinced me. So I, I compare it that I shoot from the rustic pistol, the last. Last one. So I say this was the last one. I never know. <laughs> so check the camera.